I'm Dr. Fakhti Rabari and this is Human Immunodeficiency Virus in Adults Part 2. Here are the reliable resources for HIV. In particular, we are going to cover clinical practice guidelines for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which were updated in 2021, just a few months ago. There are also guidelines for post-exposure prophylaxis, one for occupational post-exposure prophylaxis and one for non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, which are pretty similar, uh, but we will only cover one of them in this course. The next learning objective is given a patient at risk for exposure to HIV, recommend appropriate PrEP regimen. The 2021 guidelines for PrEP recommend that all sexually active patients should receive information about pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. And of course, the ultimate goal of PrEP is to prevent the acquisition of HIV inform infection along with its uh, morbidity, mortality, and cost to individuals as well as society. PrEP is recommended for individuals who are at ongoing risk for HIV exposure either from uh, sexual behaviors or in individuals who inject drugs if they report injection practices that place them at risk. Now, one thing that is important is that acute and chronic HIV, HIV infection must be excluded uh, by symptom history and HIV testing immediately before any pre-exposure prophylaxis regimen is prescribed. So let's take a look at how to exclude HIV. So clinicians should document a negative antibody test result within the seven days before initiating PrEP. And this should be done ideally with an antigen antibody test and it must be from the blood so it should be there should be a blood or serum sample and it is preferred to have an antigen antibody test uh, that's done in the laboratory and and that if that's not uh, available then a point of care antigen antibody test can be done still on the blood now, I emphasize that the sample needs to be from the blood because rapid tests that use oral fluids should not be used specifically because they can be less sensitive than blood tests. So there would be a um, high risk of false negative. The guidelines also state that clinicians should not accept patient reported test results or documented anonymous test results. Now let's take a look at the algorithm that's in the guidelines. So this is for people who are not on uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or any uh, prophylaxis, including post-exposure prophylaxis. So for someone who is about to be initiated for the first time on PrEP, uh, the antibody antigen test is preferred from the blood. And then if the results are positive, of course, this is considered HIV positive, and then they will be excluded from uh, being uh, initiated on pre-exposure prophylaxis and then if in fact this is confirmed to be a true positive then they need to be transitioned into treatment of HIV. Now for uh, individuals where they either test negative or if there is indeterminate test the next thing to consider is if the, they have had HIV exposure uh, in, you know in the past four weeks and if they have signs and symptoms of HIV acute HIV infection if the answer is no, because the results are either negative or indeterminate, it's, uh, um, you know, it's safe to assume the patient does not have HIV and it will be safe for them to initiate PrEP. Now, if the answer uh, to this question is yes, a second test needs to be done from the plasma to confirm the results. So this can be either another antibody antigen uh, assay or it could be uh, an RNA assay, HIV-1 RNA assay. And of course, if the, either of these are positive, the patient is HIV positive. If the, either of them are negative, it would be HIV negative, and then the patient can be started on PrEP. Now for the RNA assay, the level that would be significant would be 200 copies per ml. So if it's the level is less than 200 copies, for example, if it's 150, it could potentially be a false positive. 
so it is recommended to get another level and find out uh, you know if that's uh, a false positive or negative but in general if it's at least 200 copies or higher it's considered a positive result now let's take a look at prep regimen in general there are three groups of individuals who can qualify to receive uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis the first group if is uh, men having sex with men or transgender women having sex with men the second group is heterosexual men and women and the last group is uh, persons who inject drugs now in general we don't have enough data available for uh, prep use in transgender men so that's why they're not included in this um, uh, in this chart but uh, for the, the largest group by far is uh, MSM or transgender women having sex with men. So we have two oral options available for this group. So either m uh plus uh, tenofovir, desoproxol, uh, fumarate. Uh, so Truvada, this is once a day daily oral regimen. Or uh, the safer option, uh, tenofovir, alafenamide in combination with m this is also once a day oral regimen. So these two oral options are available for MSM. Uh, but for heterosexual men and women, as well as uh, people who inject drugs, we only have uh, Truvada once a day as an option. So um, uh, Descovy has not been studied in these uh, two, uh, two groups. We also most recently have an injection regimen. So this is cabotegravir. Um, that's intramuscular injection into gluteal muscle. So this is, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not something that can be done at the community pharmacy. So it has to be done at the, uh, at the clinic by the physicians. Um, so uh, this is a long acting uh, agent. So cabotegravir has a very long half-life. So the way the regimen works is that uh, the first injection is done and then the second injection is done four weeks later, but then thereafter uh, the injections are every eight weeks. So this is intended to improve adherence as well as people who do not want to uh, take uh, oral regimens daily. So, you know, they just have to get one injection every eight weeks and this will be done by, uh, by the clinicians. Now, it is important to note that uh, you should not combine the oral and injectable, so patients receive either the uh, IM injections or they can get once a day uh, oral options uh, that I mentioned up here. And uh, with the oral options, uh, it's recommended to give patients no more than 90 day supply, that way they have to come back for the refill and that, uh, you know, makes sure that uh, the patients receive their follow up. So including HIV uh, testing, uh, because we're not giving a full regimen. This is only two nukes that are used in, uh, um, in prep. So, you know, in case, uh, you know, this prep fails and the patient gets acute HIV, uh, you know, you don't want to have a regimen in those patients with only two nukes because that could lead to resistance. So it's important to check at least every uh, three months, uh, check for HIV. In case the patient tests positive for HIV, they need to be transitioned to a full ART treatment. Now, when considering who will qualify for, uh, for receiving PrEP, of course, these are people, uh, for these two groups, people who are sexually active, defined as having sex in the past six months, and they also have to be at risk of being exposed to HIV. So if uh, they have any of these, so either HIV positive sexual partner, or uh, if they had the bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the past six months, uh, or if history of inconsistent or no condom use with sexual partners. And then for persons who inject drugs uh, to qualify for PrEP, uh, they need to have either HIV positive injecting partner or uh, if they participate in sharing injection equipment such as needles that would put them at ongoing risk. So they qualify for uh, receiving PrEP. Now, before uh, we can give these patients uh, PrEP, it is important to document a negative HIV test that's been done in the past seven days as I mentioned before, and also to screen for acute HIV. So, you know, that is to screen for any signs and symptoms of acute HIV. And of course, depending on what regimen it is, they must, of course, not have any contraindications. 
And for tenofovir, uh, we know that renal function is important. So if somebody is getting a PrEP that includes TAF or tenofovir alafenamide, creatine class must be at least 30. And if it's uh, tenofovir desoproxol fumarate, the creatine class has to be at least 60. Now, these cutoffs are specifically for PrEP, not for when you use these agents for actual treatment of HIV as part of ART. So there are different uh, cutoffs for creatine clearance for full treatment, but for the purposes of uh, PrEP, these are the cutoffs. So if somebody's creatine clearance is 40, for example, they cannot get uh, you know, TDF plus m for PrEP, but they do qualify to get TAF plus m And there is no cutoff for cabotegravir. So cabotegravir is a integrase strand transfer inhibitor. It's not uh, renally cleared. Now let's take a look at uh, the options. So in general, efficacy of PrEP, either uh, you know oral or injectable, um, it is dependent on adherence to ensure that plasma drug levels reach a protective level. It's important to note that the time from initiation of PrEP to maximum protection against HIV infection is unknown. So when somebody initiates these, you know, it's not clear if they have the protection immediately or, you know, a few days later. But we do know from pharmacokinetic studies, specifically from Truvada, is that, uh, you know, we get enough concentrations of Truvada in different sites. Uh, so it re really depends on the site. So if it's, for example, people who inject drugs, the site of infection will be blood. So some sources say it will take seven days, others say 20 days. So it's safe to assume that somewhere, uh, you know, in the first, it, it will probably take around two to three weeks before uh, this pre-exposure prophylaxis is fully effective in preventing uh, HIV infection through blood. And that's 20 days in cervical, uh, cervical vaginal tissue. So for women, uh, this makes a women partic uh, you know, um, participating in vaginal intercourse, the cutoff is 20 days. Uh, for rectal tissue, which is the primary route for men having sex with men, as well as also for women, uh, that could be the route of intercourse, so seven days. And, you know, it's, it's um, faster for rectal because these are oral regimens, so, you know, it goes through um, the mouth, all the way through the colon so it goes because these are all regimens they go to the site that's of interest immediately whereas for cervical vaginal tissue it needs to be absorbed first and go into the blood and then blood needs to go to the vaginal tissue and transfuse for this drug to achieve concentration so it's uh, longer it takes longer to get enough concentrations in the vaginal tissue and we don't have any data in as far as penile tissue now, these are based on Truvada when it comes to Descovy, which was approved for PrEP in 2019. Uh, we don't really have the PK data, so it's not clear how long it will take. Uh, you know, if we had to guess, it would probably be similar to uh, Truvada, but the truth is that we just don't know. And as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Descovy has not been approved for heterosexual couples or people who inject uh, drug. It just has not been studied. It has only been studied in MSM or transgender uh, women. And of course, most uh, recently, uh, at the end of 2021, cabotegravir in uh, lung acting was approved for uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, because it, uh, so, so here's the package and it has one vial, so it only has cabotegravir in it. It does not have relpivirine. So relpivirine uh, is only used with this when you have the full treatment. But for pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's only cabotegravir, so only one agent. Now, because it's a long-acting, it takes several weeks um, for for the body to clear this. Uh, you know, some patients may may have concerns about tolerability. So, if somebody was to have a bad adverse effect to this, it will they will have that for several weeks. So, there is an optional short-acting oral cabotegravir that they can try for four weeks just to make sure they don't have any adverse effects. But this is optional because it is extremely rare for patients to have, uh, you know, um, intolerable 
adverse reactions to this drug. So that's optional. Um, just like the oral option, the time from initiation of PrEP uh, with this regimen uh, to protection is unknown. So it's not clear how long it would take. Now, because of the long half-life, there is this long tail of gradually declining drug levels. So if somebody wants to come off PrEP, uh, then because of the long half-life, they're going to have the drug in their system for a long time, including once it goes subtherapeutic, they will have that subtherapeutic levels for a long time. So if they happen to get HIV infection during that time, they are at high risk of developing drug resistance. So... Uh, that makes it tricky when somebody discontinues this. Uh, it's probably a good idea to uh, go on oral uh, PrEP if they are to have some uh, exposure to HIV. Of course, if somebody knows for sure they're not going to have exposure to HIV, it's not going to be an issue just discontinuing this. Now, let's look at the follow-up for, uh, uh, for monitoring. So, it is uh, recommended that uh, for all patients to at least every three months to get the HIV testing, as I mentioned before, to make sure that if they test positive, uh, they need to transition. This is uh, primarily based on oral PrEP, so we're talking about uh, Truvada and Descovy. So if uh, they do test positive, they need to be transitioned to ART. And the HIV testing uh, is a combination of antigen antibody and RNA assay, which I'll explain shortly. And then because of the risk factors for getting HIV and STIs are the same, uh, so bacterial STI screening is also recommended. Now it's recommended more frequently for MSM and transgender women, so every three months, whereas for everybody else, bacterial STI screening is recommended every six months. Uh, and of course, as part of these uh, every three months, uh, it's important to assess signs and symptoms of acute HIV. Uh, as well as side effect assessment, so we can manage side effects to improve adherence. Uh, there could be other reasons for non-adherence, so it's important to do a full adherence assessment uh, and provide support to patients. And uh, depending on what risk factors they have, it's also important to continue to assess those risk factors because, you know, if they don't have those risk factors, uh, then they may not be on, they may not need to be on PrEP continu continuously. So if somebody doesn't have those risky behaviors anymore, they can come off uh, PrEP. And for people who inject drug, it is important to assess uh, access to clean needles and syringe. And it, in fact, it would be important to provide to them uh, clean needles and syringes because if we don't, what ends up happening is that patients just uh, you know, share needles or use, um, you know, dirty needles that they find um, at various places. And of course, for women, it's important to do pregnant uh, pregnancy tests. And now, if somebody is receiving uh, tenofovir-based uh, uh, PrEP, it's important to assess renal function. Uh, if they are aged uh, 50 years or older, or at baseline their cranial clearance is less than 90, the renal function needs to be assessed every six months. Otherwise, if somebody is younger than 50 or if their renal function is greater than 90 at baseline, uh, they can just uh, be assessed uh, every 12 months for renal function. And then every 12 months also, it is important to assess uh, weight and lipid, uh, lipid panel if they are receiving TAFT. So TAF only, uh, TAF specifically is associated with weight gain and um, dyslipidemia. So uh, that does not apply to TDF. And lastly, evaluate the need to continue PrEP an uh, annually. For the injectable cabotegravir, which is injected every eight weeks or every two months, again, uh, at uh, one month after the first injection, it's important to uh, get HIV testing as well as uh, checking for acute HIV and assess risky behaviors. And then every two months, and the reason these are shorter follow-ups is because they match the time that the patient has to come back to the clinic to get the injections. So essentially, these are every two month injections. So if the patient is coming back to the clinic to get the injections, then there's opportunity to do HIV testing and 
make sure that they have access to clean needles and all the other things that we need to do. So at every four months, it's important to get uh, STI screening for MSM, every six months, uh, STI screening for everybody else. Every 12 months, assess uh, desire to continue injections. So in other words, uh, you know, PrEP is kind of like uh, birth control. So, you know, people don't need to be on it for forever, but as long as they have risk of being exposed, you know, the same way that, you know, for pregnant, uh, for, um, for birth control, as long as somebody doesn't want to be pregnant, they receive birth control, but it's not for life. The same applies to PrEP. As long as somebody is at risk of being exposed to HIV, they need, uh, they can be on PrEP. But if those risk factors go away, for example, let's say they stop injecting drug or if they uh, change their partner and they're no longer being exposed to a sexual partner with HIV, then they no longer need to be on PrEP. And that's something that needs to be assessed every 12 months. Now those follow-ups, it is recommended to do both antigen antibody testing and RNA assay. And that's important uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce the risk of false negative and false positive. So if both of them agree, the results of both of these tests agree. So either if both of them are positive, you assume the patient has HIV. If both of them are negative, HIV negative. But if, th if there is discordant between the two tests, either you know, one or the other is positive and negative, uh, then a new plasma specimen uh, needs to be sent for RNA assay specifically. And then based on that uh, confirmation, um, it's either HIV positive or HIV negative. Now, for, when it comes to adherence assessment and support, there are several approaches that can be effective. One is educating patients about their medications helping them ante uh, anticipate and manage side effects, asking about adherence, uh, success, and issues at follow-up visits. So for example, you can say something like, many people find it difficult to take a medicine every day, thinking about the last week, on how many days have you not taken your medicine? So this is asking, uh, well, first of all, you make sure that the patient feels safe so by making it, uh, you know, non-judgmental that this can happen to a lot of people. And then secondly, asking an open-ended question so the patient can, uh, can open up about their adherence. And helping them establish uh, dosing routines that uh, mesh with their work and social schedules. And providing a reminder system and tools. Addressing uh, financial substance use disorder or mental health needs uh, that may uh, impede adherence and facilitating social support. And of course, uh, one uh, counseling point is patients should be told to take a single missed dose as soon as they remember it, unless it is almost time for the next dose. If it's time for the next dose, they can just skip it and continue the regular dosing schedule. Please pause this video and, re, uh, and review these key components of oral medication adherence counseling. Lastly, the Senate Bill 159 in California uh, was, uh, came into effect in July of 2020. And this is important because uh, this new addition to the bill uh, essentially lets uh, a pharmacist furnish uh, or dispense HIV PrEP as well as HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. In this part, uh, I'm going to focus on the pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the bill says a pharmacist shall complete a training program approved by the board, which uh, we provide that uh, uh, here in the school uh, through this course. And then a pharmacist shall furnish at least a 30-day supply and up to a 60-day supply of PrEP if all of the following conditions are met. Now, this is a slightly different than the guideline because the guideline, which is in general for physicians, uh, you know, <clears throat> the limit is up to 90 days. Uh, for a pharmacist, is up to uh, 60 day supply, but at least a 30 day supply until, uh, and this is essentially to link them to care so they can follow up with the primary care physician. Now, it is important before a pharmacist can furnish it to make sure the patient is HIV negative and this must be based on blood, not the oral uh, saliva test. And it must be within the past seven days. Uh, no self-reported uh, signs or symptoms of acute infection. 
no currently taking contraindicated medications, and the pharmacist provides counseling to the patient on the ongoing use of PrEP, which may include education about side effects, safety during pregnancy and breastfeeding, adherence to recommended dosing, and the importance of timely testing and treatment as applicable for HIV, renal function, Hep B, Hep C, STIs, and pregnancy for individuals of childbearing capacity. And the pharmacist shall notify the patient that the, pa uh, the patient must be seen by a primary care provider to receive subsequent prescriptions for PrEP, and that the pharmacist may not furnish a 60-day supply of PrEP to a single patient more than once every two years. And the pharmacist initiating or furnishing PrEP shall not permit the person uh, to whom the drug is furnished to waive the uh, consultation required by the board. So they cannot waive all of this information. You are required to provide all this education to the patient.